ahead and have a seat. Welcome to Village Church. If this is your first time here, my name is Steve, one of the pastors here at Village Church. And as always, I am thankful and grateful to see each and every one of you. If you have a Bible, go ahead and open it to Colossians chapter 3. We're going to be starting in verse 18. I made mention that last week that when you go through an entire book of the Bible at a time that you can't avoid those difficult subjects. And today I have the privilege of telling wives how to be wives. What a what a joy. Always well received. (laughs) Colossians as a whole builds a gospel ethic for all of life. The Apostle Paul begins by presenting the supremacy of Christ over all things. Everything that exists is under the authority of Jesus Christ. Therefore, to teach wrongly about the gospel is to rebel against God's rightful authority as ruler over all things. The apostle then refutes false teachers who lie about Christ's sufficiency and salvation. And then he urges the Colossians to fight against false teachers for the good of the church and the glory of God. Chapter 3, as we have seen over the past few Sundays, builds on the supremacy and the sufficiency of Christ by actually giving us this ethic for living in submission to the rule of Christ over absolutely all things. Faith in Jesus gives us a new life by which we put off the old man who is in rebellion against Jesus in order that we may put on the new man who seeks to follow Jesus, seeks to become more like Jesus, through actually living a life by which we submit to Jesus in all things. The obvious examples of what putting off the old man looked like were examples of repenting of anything that does not worship God alone and also loving your neighbor as yourself. Paul then continues this idea by showing the new man worships God through loving like Jesus loves as you experience the peace that can only be known through reconciliation with God because of your faith. You know, for many, there's a great temptation to stop right there. You like it that we cover these general ideas of how to live out your faith in Jesus, but we are tempted to interpret those ideas to fit our vision for life and the place of others in it. We get a little bristly when we actually seek to give specifics as to what that's actually going to look like, not just for you, but also for society at large. And that is why I believe Colossians 3 ends the way that it does. The apostle doesn't just leave it in vague generalities and say, well, love God and love other people. Good luck with all that. Do as you will. No, the apostle gets specific. He goes in and he gets to the heart of the most intimate relationships in our lives. And he seeks to show that it is in the family that you're going to have the bedrock through which all society is going to be built and all of society is going to be affected. If you get marriage wrong, you're going to get a lot of other things wrong. But if you get marriage right under God's design, you will have an impact literally for generations that will shape culture. But that requires us to actually believe God, doesn't it? When we actually get to the point where we're like, wives, this is how you're supposed to be a wife. Well, you don't know my situation. You don't understand my love language. You don't understand my personality. How do you think you can say these things? So I want to preface it this morning. I'm not really saying much. God says it for me. And so at the halfway point of this sermon, if you've got a problem, it's God at heaven dot com. That is where you send your email addresses because I'm not the one that wrote it. God wrote this, not me. Look in verse 18. Wives. See right there, I'm already in trouble, aren't I? (laughs) Wives. Submit to your husbands as is fitting to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. I note that he starts off by saying, wives, submit to your husbands. And I know that there's a natural retort that is going to come. You don't know my husband, Steve. That's right, I might not. I probably do, but I might not. Well, see, if you don't understand that this situation is just so different from everybody else's situation, it's you're right, I don't know the situation. I also don't care. Because that doesn't change the text, does it? 
And see, the real issue that we have is not with someone's opinion as to how you apply this verse. The problem is just that God would call you to be in subjection to another human being. And again, I've not interpreted the text in any way. I've just said the text. Wives, be subject to your husbands as is fitting to the Lord. And so we need to understand that regardless of how we feel, regardless of the mood that we are in, regardless of what we think our right place in the world is, my feelings, my experience, my emotions, none of that does anything to lessen the reality that God has made a demand on you. And if you are in the role of a wife, God has made a demand of you that if you trust him, that's key, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you must understand that the imperative here is that you obey God before you obey anyone else. Therefore, wives, be subject to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Number one this morning, God's designs are never arbitrary. They're not. We want to treat them as though they are. That God makes this command about marriage that doesn't apply anywhere else in life, doesn't apply anywhere else into the world, but for specifically in marriage, this is the way gender design is to work out. Do you know how arbitrary you're making God when you look at the Word of God that way? You see, the apostle starts with this idea that we are to set our minds on the things that are above, that we are to seek the things that are above, that we are to put off the old man. And of course, he uses the example of idolatry, which begins with sexuality for him. Then he says that we are to put off this thing where we would mistreat others, where we would live in constant strife and turmoil with others because of our actions, love God, love others. And then he says, put off that old man, put on the new man with this kindness, with this life that would seek to live under the peace of Christ, giving the love of Christ to other people. And so it is no accident that immediately following that, he gets into your relationship between husband and wife and child. Because what Paul is saying is is that all that the gospel will call you into is going to begin at the very bedrock of God's design for society, and then it is going to tease out from there. But make no mistake, the bedrock of society is marriage. It is family. And for too long, the church has been acting otherwise. We must understand that your marriage is a great testimony as to how and how much You believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. I've had so many couples come to me. He's wrong, she's wrong. But the problem with it is is that marriage never leaves only the victims being the husband and wife. And that's why the apostle includes that third party, children. Because your marriage, just like the relationships we talked about last week, doesn't exist to make much of you. Wife, I know you want him to worship you. And you're the only thing that exists in his life. But that's not how God designed him. God designed him to pursue him above all things. Husband, you're a terrible God. (laughs) If she worships you, she's going to be really disappointed and want to exchange you quickly. (laughs) It's because she wasn't designed to worship you. She wasn't designed to meet every need you could possibly ever have. No one can live up to that standard. But I can tell you from many, many years of experience that the greatest victim of marital strife is always the children. Every single time. And so from what I'm going to tell you this morning from the Word of God is meant to help you to cultivate a legacy by which You can build a family where you have a greater vision than just the self, where you have a vision of leaving a family legacy of disciples of Jesus Christ that can go on from generation to generation to generation. But the only way that's going to happen is if you submit to the supremacy of Christ in absolutely all things, especially where your marriage is concerned. 
There was a time when Western civilization understood that family is the bedrock of society. And as I said, the church must recover that vision because what Satan seeks to destroy, Christ redeems. And there's one thing that is clear in our society with all that they are asking us to synergize on, with all that they are asking us to capitulate to, with all that they are asking us to compromise on, it is the nuclear heterosexual family that is under attack in our era. The family is the most influential sphere in the world. Therefore, understand sexual immorality, the cancer of feminism, homosexuality, transgenderism, selfishness, egalitarianism, passive men, etc., are all a satanic attack on what Paul uses as the most natural outlet for what it means to put on the new self in Christ. Some are tempted to view the structure that Paul offers as God's design for the family, as I said, not applying to other spheres of life. That makes no sense, especially contextually speaking, and I hope you'll see that. What Paul is actually doing is noting the impact of the gospel on the family. And then, of course, <clears throat> excuse me, he teases that out to every part of soul in society. This design goes all the way back to the book of Genesis. God's design is beautiful. Therefore, we must embrace it. We must not put it off. Submitting to Christ then means submitting to the designs of God. Therefore, when God calls women to be subject to their husbands, this is not belittling to you as a woman or even a human being. The call of God is a call to worship him. And so, if you want to exalt the self, yes, you're going to have problems with this. But if you are seeking to truly exalt God, to truly worship him, to truly give him glory above any and all things, then you will understand that the greatest gift that you can give to yourself and others is actually to live first in subjection to God. And then through that, in subjection to his designs. And yes, wives, God has called you to be subject to your husbands. And there's a way that that works itself out. In Ephesians chapter 5, starting in verse 22, we have really a more popular text that is very similar, maybe more specific. In verse 22, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. <clears throat> For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body and is himself its savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Did you catch that? In some things? And how you feel that day? And whether you got the moody blues or the moody highs? And whether or not it's raining outside? No, in everything. Again, that's not me saying that. That's the word of God. Marriage, well, Paul sums up this section of Ephesians 5, was God's prophecy to give a picture of the relationship between Christ and his church. That's why he uses the example of Christ and his church. Now, I ask you, the church living in subjection to Christ does Christ belittle the church through that subjection? No. Christ sacrificed his life for the church. That is what leadership looks like. It exalts those who submit to leadership. And so understand, wives, if you look at being in subjection to your husband as belittling to you, then what you're actually having a problem with is God's design for his church and his own glory. And so, my preference, my personality, my hang-ups, my hang-ons, whatever chip on my shoulder I might have from experience, does absolutely nothing to change God's design for your life. But this works out in practical ways. And so I want you to understand, wives, whatever excuses you are making for not living in subjection or submission to your husband is nothing more than sin. Understand, you are never going to nag your husband into being a good leader. 
Because we are so sinful in our experience. What we will do is say, well, I would live in, in subjection to you if you would fill in the blank. That's not what subjection looks like. What you're actually doing is trying to use some type of reverse hypnosis to put yourself in leadership still because you are the one holding the standard. Well, I would if. Some what subjection looks like. As is fitting to the Lord means that the reason you submit yourself to your husband has nothing to do with your husband. It has everything to do with the rule of Jesus Christ. Remember that supremacy of Christ stuff we talked about earlier? Sufficiency of Christ? Paul's still talking about that. He's saying, if you believe Christ is supreme, wouldn't you submit to his leadership? Well, Jesus uses his leadership and he wields it and he says, wives, live in subjection to your husbands. And that's why he says, as is fitting to the Lord. When you undermine your husband's authority, you are actually attempting to get him to submit to whatever picture you have in your mind of what you want him to be. That is a sin that you need to repent of. In Genesis 3.16, we see the reality of what the curse of sin destroyed. It didn't just destroy man's relationship with God. <clears throat> to the woman, God said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. Sorry. It was hard on me too. I can't tell you the foot pain. I had to stand there for hours. Then I had to sleep on this weird couch that they paid $22 for. Build me a thousand. That's a joke for another day. But it doesn't stop there. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. This is the source of every problem in human relations, but especially in marriage. It's the curse of sin. And what we don't want to admit is that that is what we are struggling with when our marriages fall out of sync, when our marriages aren't harmonious, is that it isn't a he said, she said. It is a sin problem that is going on inside of your marriage. The struggle to live out the leadership structure within the home is the result of sin. And God told us that was going to be a problem. He is going to rule over you. But there's going to be this temptation to be contrary. Do any of you women struggle with that? Your desires will lead you to seek to be contrary to your husband. That is a sin to be repented of. The strife in the home, though, stretches into a society that is obsessed with equity at the cost of God's design for beauty and distinction in gender. Our gender differences are not issues by which we should fight against. Rather, we should embrace them to live out God's design so that we can have the unique beauty that is different between men and women. And this shakes out across all of society. Men should act and look like men. Women should act and look like women. Now, before you get angry that I said that, understand that that is something literally everyone in the world agreed about 15 minutes ago. It's only in the past few years that we've lost our minds. And what we're actually living with is the curse of sin from Genesis chapter 3. But we have put the pedal to the metal on this and the fact that our marriages are falling apart and we're refusing to live in subjection to husbands is what is actually, you can connect the dots all the way from there to the gender identity issues that teenagers are struggling with right here and right now in our society. Therefore, we must understand that God is not arbitrary only to have these precepts to apply inside of marriage. They apply all over society and we know this in our hearts. A few nights ago, a car alarm was going off on my street. You know that one house? It's always that one house. Every time, that one house. And so the car alarm was going off and it woke me up. And, you know, you don't know if it's yours or not. So, of course, what did I do? 
I got up and I got ready. And I said, well, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen tonight. So I ran downstairs, looked out the window. I'm not crazy. I'm not opening the door first, all right? <laughs> not that crazy. And there was a few doors down, and since it was that house, I knew there wasn't really a problem. <laughs> but there's a reason I went and my wife didn't. Because if anybody had to go down that night, it wasn't going to be my wife. It wasn't going to be one of my children. Because there is something intuitive to being a person who exists with the image of God in us where we know that the man is the one who protects the family. Now, my wife could go, but here's another thing about the design of God. She is far less physically capable of protecting the family than I am. That's just biology. And if you've got a problem with that, you've been watching too many movies where 115 pound women can beat up 275 pound men. I don't care how much jujitsu you're doing, lady, you're losing that fight every single time. Entertainment lies. There are differences in the way that God has designed men and women. God has designed the family to be led by the husband. Eve was created out of Adam's rib as a helpmate. 1 Corinthians 11.3 presents the family structure. I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ. The head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. Do you see the way that it works? The temptation to undermine the husband's authority then is an attack on God's design. Don't stifle your husband's leadership. Submit to him. Help him. His leadership, though, is qualified in the text, isn't it? How is it qualified? As is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, you lead them like Jesus in worship of God. Therefore, the the design is that a godly man marries a godly woman and has godly children functioning under a godly design. You get one of those parts wrong, and it won't be smooth. It won't function as it is intended. If I, as the husband, as the father in my household, by the way, I should have told you, I am married and I have children, so I get it. It's not perfect. But if I call my wife to disobey God's word, that's where the subjection ends. Because what did the text, what did the structure say? God, me, my wife. Therefore, when I tell her rebel against God, she has a greater submission to him than she has to me. And so she says, no, but here's the way marriage is supposed to work. If she refuses to disobey God and I call her, her refusal is supposed to be a help to me to repent of my sin. Do you see the way that things will flow if everyone will live as God intends us to live? It's not arbitrary. Men aren't supposed to act like women. Women aren't supposed to act like men. And the earlier you get that straight, the more joy from God you will have, friends. When you undermine God's design, though, you undermine your entire life. And so you can receive everything that I've said Wives. And you can say, nope, not in my house. Okay. You're not hurting me. You are hindering the joy that you will ever be capable of. And you will reap the misery that you are sowing in your life right now. But don't get it twisted. Number two this morning. Christian men must lead with intention. Christian men must lead with intention. Reread verse 19. Husbands, love your wives. Do not be harsh with them. Skip down to verse 21. Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Skip down to verse 23. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. And so verse 20 ends with pleasing Christ. Then verse 25 ends 
or excuse me, verse 24 ends with serving Christ. And so what's all of this about? This is not about obeying human beings. This is about living your life for Jesus Christ. And there isn't another path that he has called you to be on. But men, husbands, are called to set the standard for Christ. Just like the wife, a husband's first calling is to love and pursue Christ above everything else. Note also that this text assumes the leadership of the husband and father. It doesn't actually say the husband should lead. It just assumes that he already is. The husband is the head of the home. And so men, husbands, the question this morning isn't, are you leading? You are. The question is, are you doing a good job? (laughs) Are you doing a poor job? And your submission to Christ is going to be the answer to that question. The term from verse 19, harsh, don't be harsh. is actually the same for make someone bitter. This is about the tone and mood that you set in your home. I need the men to understand this this morning. When the husband walks into the room, he should be a cooling element that makes the home function smoothly. Men should not be the ones to introduce chaos and disorder into the home, which is what sets the mood for harshness and resentment and bitterness. Rather, men, you are called by God to be the binding element that holds it all together, that sets a positive direction for your home. Therefore, if there is turmoil in the home, when the husband and father enters the situation in the room, the rest of the family should thank God you're there. Oh, thank God you are here. We need you. Too often, men Introduce the chaos. Too often when the husband or the father comes home, kids start whispering, shh, 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 daddy's home. Don't wake the grizzly. It's that temperamental, that anger that maybe you carry around with you, that is a sin against God. You are called by God to be the level head of your home. You are called by God to be the most trustworthy one in the home. You are called by God to be the one that when you enter the home, everybody says, thank God daddy's home. Because having you around makes everyone's lives better. Men, husbands, is that your experience? Friends, Being the binding element is what leadership is all about. You are not going to make it through this world without turmoil. You're not going to make it through this world without suffering. You're not going to make it through this world without sin impacting you in great ways, often your own. But if you can't be the one that walks into the wife's life and immediately alleviates a tremendous amount of her anxiety, If you can't be the one that walks into the child's life and immediately the peace of Christ enters the room, you've got a lot of repenting to be working on because that is the call of God for your life. Husbands are the leader. Yes, this is true physically, but also pay attention to the spiritual element. By God's grace, there is a growing popularity in evangelicalism to renew masculinity. And I thank God for that. It's helpful, but it can get misguided very quickly. If you reduce masculinity to bravado, if you reduce masculinity to, oh man, I can squat over 300 pounds. I own the most tricked out AR-15 in the neighborhood. You may be impressive physically to those around you, but here's the better question. Can you teach your wife and children scripture? Do you pray with your family? Can you teach your family to pray? Are you kind? Are you kind to your wife? Are you kind to your children? Are you leading your family into the presence of God as the spiritual leader of the home? 
Do your children know that you love them? Do your children know that you will never walk out of their lives? Do you hug your daughters? Do you hug and high five your sons? I'll tell you something as a father and as a husband. The one thing, all the questions you might have about Steve Gentry, the one question I never want anyone, especially my three, to ask is, does my father love me? If your children don't know whether you love them or not, you are a scumbag. And until you repent, don't claim the name of Christ. You need to drive into their psyche so hard. I love you. I will always be your father. You will always be my son. You will always be my daughter. No matter what happens, I will always run through hell with a fire hose for you. If you're not living like that, you got a lot of repenting to do. And that is where family begins to crumble. That is why wives struggle to subject themselves to your authority. It's because when somebody has to ask the question of, do you actually love me? How can you expect anybody to submit to your leadership? What a pity it would be if the most macho looking of men had nothing to offer but spiritual death to their families. What a pity. Men sacrifice for the good of others, thus rejecting passivity, thus rejecting selfishness. Husbands who lay a heavy burden on their wives are the equivalent of the Pharisees in the day of Christ. Don't ask your wife to fill the office God has called you to. Don't ask her to work when you won't. Men, hear me. You cannot be lazy and a Christian at the same time. You will never produce from your wife and children what is not true of you. You set the standard. I'm tired of seeing wives work themselves to the bone, turning their hair gray because they're doing the work you're supposed to be doing because you're too lazy, you're too scatterbrained to get it together. I don't care what experiences you have had that has left you less masculine than someone else. Pull your pants up, back away from the computer, and get going for Jesus Christ and lead your family. Work yourself to the bones. Go to bed at night exhausted because you worked hard for your family. Don't put the burden on your wife's back. And if you're a stay-at-home dad, I don't care if this offends you. Get a job. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 5. I better stop. Ephesians... <laughs> I wasn't in there. <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> God at heaven.com. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25 says it this way Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. Do you see what's going on there? Christ put it all on the line. I mean, this is no hyperbole. Jesus Christ literally sacrificed his life for the church. Don't be the kind of man that sacrifices your family for leisure. Sacrifices your family for hobbies. My family is my hobby. Too many men view their children and wives as some kind of barrier to the things you actually want to do. Sacrifice every single hobby you enjoy. They are the barrier to what God has called you to do, to love your wife and to love your children. Yes. Whatever's standing in the way of them is what's got to die. But too often, we treat our families as though they are the obstacle. If your family isn't following you, 
The problem isn't them. You probably haven't set a tone by which they believe you are working yourself to the bone for their joy and eternal souls. I'll tell you, if your children look at you and say, every day he wakes up and gives his all for me. That's an obedient child. Because that's a child that knows you love them, knows you're laying it all on the line for them. Does your wife look at you as her oldest child? If so, (laughs) is it because of how you act? Or does your wife see you as her provider, protector, and leader? I will tell you, you set the tone for that, not her. So if your family is full of chaos, if your family is full of turmoil, men, don't look to your wife and say, well, if she would get it together. No, you go look in the mirror and you say, what have I done to cultivate this type of environment in my home. And then you get to changing the environment for the good of your wife, for the good of your children, to the glory of God in Jesus Christ. Hear this. Annoying women only get that way due to a man who accepts it and probably causes it through your childishness. Too many men are living their lives trying to look like an adolescent, trying to relive the glory days of the 11th grade. If you peaked in the 11th grade, I feel sorry for you. (laughs) Grow up. Be a man. Get some maturity about you. And by the way, annoying women only get that way because of annoying men. And I can tell you right now, if I can't wait to get out of your presence... I can only imagine what life is like for your kids and your wife. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 4. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. He furthers what he says here in Colossians. Colossians says don't make your wife bitter, but then note what it says in verse 21 literally means do not exasperate your children so that they give up or lose heart. Don't annoy your children. It can also be translated as don't nag your children. Fathers, your presence in your children's lives should be life-giving, not life-taking. Don't depreciate your children by mocking them. Some of you feel so bad about who you are that you spend most of your time belittling your children. Don't look at your child and say, why can't you act right? If I'm around, I'll tell you why. You. You're the reason they can't act right. Friends, don't mock your children because you're like Uncle Rico in Napoleon Dynamite swearing you can throw a football over a mountain. Nobody cares. <laughs> you may have been some great athlete 20 years ago, but stop telling me what you did 20 years ago. I want to know what you did today. Don't depreciate your child's worth by mocking them. Don't set unrealistic goals for your children. Setting a tone by which nothing they ever do measures up to your standard. And they always could have done better. Show affection to your children. Love on them. Provide for your children. Don't watch your bank account grow while your kids are walking around in rags. And if you don't have any money in your checking account and they are walking around in rags, get a job. It is a calling of God to provide for your family like they deserve to be provided for. Don't preach a poverty gospel to me. Disciple your children. Pay attention to your children. Never ignore your children. Don't criticize your children. Don't neglect your children. And don't excessively discipline your children. Those are always that you take life away from them, thus disobeying the word of God. Proverbs 1.8 sets the standard. My son, 
Hear your father's instruction. Forsake not your mother's teaching. And I will warn some of the parents. You are currently setting an environment and atmosphere in your home where your children cannot wait to ignore your instruction and teaching. But this, of course, necessitates instructing and teaching them. Get out of bed. Turn the TV off. Put your phone down. Please change out of your pajamas and never go in public with your pajamas on. (laughs) Get dressed so you can actually lead your kids. Your kids should obey you because they know that your way will lead to the best life possible. But that can't happen if you set an atmosphere of chaos. Fathers and mothers, if you set an atmosphere where you are constantly arguing with each other, where you are always taking your family on an emotional roller coaster, get it together, nutcase. You got kids to raise. Well, my therapist said, that's half your problem right there. Ask yourself what you did to cause this and what are you going to start doing to prevent it? Your children should have a reverent fear of you because that is your job. The answer is simple. If your children are disobedient and running around like feral cats, I see them. (laughs) What did you do to cause this? Because you need to do the opposite from here on out. It is your fault. Stop looking for somebody to tell you it isn't. Repent and grow in representing Christ to your family so you can send them into the world as respectable Christians. Then finally, submitting to God's design builds a better culture. Submitting to God's design builds a better culture. Look in verse 22. Bond servants... Obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ, for the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. Masters, treat your bond servants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. What happens in the family shapes the surrounding world. I want you to understand what the apostle's doing in this text. He started with the family, and then he goes to what really is an extreme example in society. And he says, the same precepts that guide the family guide the rest of society. Therefore, is the society around you filled with sin? Yes. What's the first step that you take to fix the ailings of society? Build a family. Build a godly family. Don't get so distracted by the example of slavery that you miss the point of the text. I will qualify this briefly. Yes, there is a version of slavery that is acceptable in Scripture that is akin to indentured servitude. And so when atheists try to do a gotcha with that question, yes, there is a version of slavery that's biblical. It's like a debtor's prison. No, chattel slavery in the antebellum South was not that. If you kidnap people and sell them at auction, the law of God actually advocates for a just nation to execute you under capital punishment as a man stealer or kidnapper. So scripture does not anywhere advocate for that, nor does it excuse it. But what Paul is doing here is actually showing how great the impact of the gospel is on society if we would begin to apply it at every level. The master, bondservant, or slave relationship was a cultural example of the shift that the triumph of the gospel would make in all spheres of authority in the world. 
This is a culture in which all cylinders must fire in God's design. Or again, the machine won't function properly. Husbands, wives, and children submitting to the Lordship of Jesus Christ respectively form a God-glorifying family. And so Paul pushes the logical limit of that analogy and says, if you form the bedrock of society, you will impact the far reaches of society with the gospel of Jesus Christ. He is envisioning a gospel powerful enough that a redeemed master and a redeemed slave could actually work together in such a way that it glorifies God. Therefore, authority is actually about representing Christ to the world. In that culture, the slave did not get an identity, but through the gospel, the slave has a new identity. Galatians 4, 7, you are no longer a slave, but a son. If a son, then an heir through God. In light of God's ultimate authority, his authority over the slave is more important than the master. But if the master also submits to Christ, the master's identity can no longer be found as being the ultimate authority in the slave's mind. Rather, the master is now living in subjection to Christ, thus changing the dynamic between master and bondservant or slave. It doesn't remove the master's authority, understand. Instead, it changes how he wields it. Since the slave would then now be a co-heir in Christ through faith with the master, the master must wield his authority in such a way that he does not do the wrong described in verse 25. And so the master must ask himself, how can I wield my authority? to edify, encourage, and exhort the slaves as fellow Christians to show that they are my co-heir with Christ. Friends, authority and submission must be wielded to redeem and form a culture for God. That's why Ephesians 6, 9 says, Masters, stop threatening, do the same to them knowing that he who is both their master and yours in heaven, there is no partiality with him. How they treat others will serve as a direct reflection on how God has treated them in Christ. You can only find that type of culture-shaking dynamic in the gospel of Jesus Christ. He envisions a culture by which the slave never wants to leave the master because the master wields his authority in the same life-giving way Jesus Christ wields his authority. Start with your family. Form a culture that fits his design and live it out in front of others. Stop trying to keep up with your unbelieving friends Start becoming the influence for your unbelieving friends. Because when you have a marriage and family under God's design, those around you will say, how in the world do you love each other so much? How in the world do you form a family where your kids actually obey and respect you? And the answer you will have is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Go to work. Become your boss's best staff member. That's the only general equity application of the master-slave relationship. If you are the boss, go to work and treat your staff like Christ has treated you. Christians are meant to form culture. We are not meant to just go with the flow and accept whatever the world throws at us. We serve Christ above all. A few application points. First, repent of any action or attitude that defies God's design for family. If it doesn't fit God's design, it's got to change. Secondly, wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Thirdly, husbands, lead your families as Christ leads. And then finally, engage the culture 
with the design of God in all spheres.